Hello. Hi, everybody. Greg Yamico here, and excited to be back with AO. Okay, it looks like it just kicked in. So, hi, everybody. Greg Yamico here. Excited to be back with AO and getting the uh, getting some sharing and experience with my life and history with you guys based on some of the questions that you answered or asked me. So, and hopefully, I can answer. That gives you some insight. Um, a little bit of history as I usually do. I am a, well, got a finance degree from the University of Tennessee and I got into investments early, started with a financial planning firm that evolved in a money management firm that ended up being a, um, a mutual fund company. And started a mutual fund that, that in 95, that in five years to 2000, it grew to be the number one growth and income fund in the country for three and five years and was, um, uh, took the firm to a billion dollars in assets and <laughs> rode that wave up then rode it back down again as the negatives of the early 2000s if you remember that so um, seeing that future and uh, of a lot of the investing that we were doing and where the world was going I saw I saw the opportunities through connectivity through software and had done a project with somebody with my investment firm that ended up partnering with, and we started a software company in 2004, and I went to India and set up um, an office there to do development and got into, um, after doing some web application work for people, saw the future being mobile apps and or the early time period there, right around 2010-ish, nine or 10-ish, not, not too long after mobile apps came out. And so we build mobile apps and e-commerce applications for people along with, um, along with doing a lot of database work and so forth. I've worked with Coca-Cola and quite a few of the big companies in, in Knoxville, Tennessee, like Rightway and Mid Labs and, and CalSan, doing a lot of uh, a lot of integration, database work, and making sure their systems are online. So it just gives you a little bit of insight of my history and, and some where some of my experience and answers will be coming from. So our first question today is by Perry, and Perry asks, how do you evaluate new opportunities in side business? Okay, business description and background question. I have a stable core business with a great team. We sold eight figures on Amazon last year through the FBA program and have trained our operations and admin team so that we can step away from the business for a week or so at a time. We currently have several ideas for side businesses that complement our core business. Some of them are, one, consulting with other Amazon sellers to help them be more efficient, including on-site workshops or site consulting. Two, creating courses to help with process efficiency. Three, brand management, helping others, other people get up and running on Amazon and managing their presence on the platform for a commission. For doing private label on Amazon, in all of these cases, we would have to hire or build a new team to execute the idea. So, how do you decide which idea to act on first? Thanks. Uh, well, hi Perry. That's this uh, interesting question. Uh, congratulations on your success in growing out what you're doing and pr providing the opportunity to share this knowledge and give insight to people that want to grow their e-commerce operations online. So, uh, what I like to say is that the decision to consider which one of these options you would want would be relative to, I like to look at it in the form of a marketplace decision, okay? Where are you going and um, where do you think things are going based on what the marketplace would want? So, if you put out one of those ideas, okay, uh, consulting with Amazon and so forth, and start talking to some of your existing clients and ask them if you provided these services, what would they find most attractive? Or given where they were coming from, where in the early stages of, of their startup, where, what would they have found most attractive? Okay. So getting that feedback from the people that you would be selling it to, because it sounds like a lot of, um, a lot of maybe relationships you have or things that you're doing in the world out there would, would would those type of people would be interested in some of these services that you're providing I also could look at would look at getting some type of list of people who sell online uh, through Amazon and with those people you could go out and you could do a survey or you could do calls to them 
and say, hey, um, Mr. Amazon reseller, seller, whatever, I'm looking at offering these type of services and what would it look like to you? What would you find most favorable to your situation or where you were coming from that you would have found uh, of most value? And from there, you're gonna get that feedback that's gonna allow you to pick which one these are. Sometimes, you know, people kind of evolve into this, they devolve in one area and they start doing it and you hear about the pivot all the time. People have an initial idea of where they're gonna go in business, but then they pivot because the marketplace starts giving them feedback and information that allows them to go in a direction that is where they really take off. So here, instead of maybe making an investment in one area and just seeing, uh, I would try to explore the marketplace and get as much feedback from as many people as you can as to which one of these ideas would be most attractive. You know, I really like um, creating courses because I like the idea of creating courses because I've done that for other people and helping them with a process. So you could be selling these online courses to people through funnels and I've talked about ClickFunnels before and their operation of selling things online where you could sell courses to people and they could pay so much money, um, hundreds of dollars or $997 or $1,497 for a course that's gonna teach them over time how to sell through your programs and build up a environment. You, your investment would be you know, getting the video camera, creating the course, um, putting together a good presentation and recording those and getting them up online. If you've got all that knowledge or if your team has that knowledge, then you could be interviewed or your team could be interviewed or, or all of you can be interviewed at different times to build out a nice process and program for people and then selling that in that program online. But I wouldn't do any of that until you found out what you feel is most attractive. I say that about the course because I think that's a low investment to get going and it's once it starts scaling, you're not gonna need a huge amount of people to keep the business running. You can use it, you can use um, outside vendors to help with a lot of the marketing and so forth and I find that as just an attractive opportunity from my experience. So um, anyway, try the survey, try calling people, get as much, collect as much market intel as you can to make that happen. Okay. Next question, Heather. Heather asks, what is the best way to get employee participation for non-mandatory reviews or surveys? Okay, well, interesting that we just talked about surveys. Um, business description and background question. Through my payroll company, we have monthly surveys that go out that ask certain questions in regards to the company and employee satisfaction. Each month, we average about 50% participation, and despite reminders, getting some people to participate is, is pulling teeth. Any recommendations for better employee participation? Elevator pitch. We offer high-end holistic grooming experiences for busy pet owners whose animals are part of the family. Okay, Heather, you've asked questions before. I'd love your, your, your business. You seem very passionate about it. And of course, you're, you're using the right words there that you know, animals as part of the family business and so forth is, is very good. So. Uh, I would ask you how many employees do you have okay that's key because what you um, what you're trying to do here is not I mean you're probably above average in the percentages of how many people have participated in this and getting a lot more can be challenging but why do you need a lot more okay if people are those that think they need to say something are saying it probably those that don't feel like everything's going kosher you're not hearing from them. So I wouldn't as much worry about it, but what what options could you consider, okay? If I was doing this myself and I wanted to know more from these employees, then I would call them, okay? But you know, also looking at how many, do you have five employees? Do you have 10? Do you have 50 employees, okay? Even if you add up to 20, 25 employees, I still calling them and asking them some questions and also potentially meeting with them uh, taking them to a lunch or dinner or something where you can have that one-on-one um, -on -one time to kind of see where they are. You can kind of consider it maybe a review, but get a feedback from them and stay engaged because the most important aspect or asset that we have as a business is the people. It's also our biggest challenge and uh, frustration in business are the people that we have. 
So making sure you have the right people and when you have the right people, keeping the right people is so, so important. So spending some time with them, listening to them, hearing their concerns, asking them probing questions and going deeper based on what they say to go deeper with that. And then based on what they say there, go even deeper. And that's what I've been learning from Eric Maddox on high value listening approach. Uh, so let's see, what else did I want to say about this? Um, I could, you would offer them something of value for them to participate. If it's very important and you think that you're not getting it because and these other things you don't want to do or something is different about it or you have too many people, offer them a Starbucks or an Amazon gift card. Okay, what, <laughs> you know, $25, $50, hey, complete this program or hey, if you complete the next four surveys, we'll give you a $100 Amazon or $100 Starbucks card, something like that. That could be motivational for to get their feedback. Uh, but again, like I was saying, the people that are not getting the feedback probably because they don't have a lot to say. So trying to spend a lot of money to entice them may not be getting the most value. I would call a few and ask them why I don't participate. But you know, all of us online are getting so many questions. Every time I fly on an airline, they're sending me um, email after email. I mean, a credit card company is sending me email, email, send, take this survey. You just talked to one of our representatives, take this survey. The phone company, send this survey. So we're getting surveyed to death in, in a lot of ways. And so it just may be that people are overtaking surveys. And if that's the case, but this information is that important to you, then take these other steps, calls, meetings, um, offering some type of, of certificate or some gift certificate for them to participate. So I really like your thinking on this, Heather, as far as um, uh, wanting to hear from your people and know what's going on and know what's going, what they're finding valuable or where you can get actual uh, knowledge for helping your customers in your business by working with them. How can you become more efficient? So maybe that's why you want to have some of the conversations is like, what can we do to be more efficient as a company? How can we better serve our customers? How can we add more value to our, as our, uh, to our customers? All those things could be um, very insightful for you to hear it from multiple sources and then make changes as needed. Okay, so next question is Vanessa. Vanessa asks, what are some ideas that I could use to create a subscription revenue business? Thank you in advance. Business description, background of question. I have a new consulting business focusing on HR strategies, process improvement, HR software implementation, and organizational change management. And I also provide coaching services for business professionals, HR executives, and NLP. I would like to get some advice on how I can establish a subscription revenue business for HR services for companies that help them scale. Thank you, mentors, for all the time and help. Okay, Vanessa, good, good question. Good. Um, I just talked a little bit about it in a previous one about setting something an online course. Uh, here, what you're talking about is maybe something in a form of a membership service. Okay, that people would be participate by being a member, and you're going to offer different value. You can do online. You can do live trainings. You could do video um, recordings and and put those up online. You could show processes of how to follow or you could have a whole library of forms that you use in the hiring form the uh, checklist to the new steps for uh, the the checklist for steps for the new employee type thing and you can have all these processes in place that helps businesses that are not at a big level HR you know team and, and manager and so forth that could utilize this knowledge and awareness to help them um, uh, deal with it. You know, how do you checklist on well, how you terminate an employee? Checklist on on um, what how you do an interview process with the employee? How checklist on how you do quarterly updates with the employee? Just all those things that you could be putting into a library of tools that people would use and want to buy this service. What your, um, this area is, is huge. Like I said just previously, that people are our biggest asset and trying to find the right people and retain the right people and allow for their improved growth and satisfaction in our business is so important. So what you're doing is, is a lot of value there and I feel a lot of opportunities with, with this. Um, uh, Ryan, okay, I'm gonna say here, let me, 
look up something for you. There's a membership guru guy out there that you may want to do a little reading on. So I'm going to see if I can membership site guru. Let's see. Uh, who is it? Uh, Stuart. It's Stuart something. Uh, Stuart McLaren. Stu. S-T-U-M-C-L-A-R-E-N. Look up Stu McLaren. He is a, the membership guru guy out there that provides all kinds of information about setting up membership sites. So I would look for him. I mean, I would read up on him and get some of his knowledge, maybe his books, whatever he's offering, and figure out how to set up a potential membership. Now, it's not, a, it, it's not necessary for you to have a membership site here. Uh, so let me bring back up the video so I feel like I'm talking to somebody. Okay, so it's not necessary that it's, this is a membership approach. These are, like I said, different things. It could be done in a some type of, you're selling a library of services or you're selling some type of education. But try to do it where you can scale it. Where you're going out to talk to these businesses and so forth, um, that's an option and that's a lot bigger dollars. But if you're not charging the right money to do that, a Sometimes people think you're making money because you charge four thousand or five thousand or ten thousand dollars for something. Don't realize the time and investment that's caught that is there. That when you really calculate it all out, the profitability on that may be five or ten percent. Okay, but if you go out and sell an online service for seven ninety seven um, for one time buy, or you sell it for two hundred dollars a month, the profitability on that could be fifty percent, sixty percent, seventy percent. Okay, so. I would look at ways to be scalable with what you offer and can minimize the investment. But you package a bunch of knowledge, whether it's you talking or it's processes or a library of content and you putting it out there, it could be a way to, for you to make a lot of money and um, do it at a higher uh, net profit margin. Okay, next question. Next question is Brad. And Brad asks, what is an acceptable time frame for royalty payments paid to someone when acquiring a business. Okay, business description and background of question. My wife and I are looking to start a, a concession business. We have talked with someone that has been in the business for a while with an established name and following and they are looking to exit the business. They are offering us their name and associated things like logos, graphics, etc. They are also willing to turn over any current contracts that they have and contacts for other potential contracts and are asking for a small percentage in return. There have been no discussion of a length of time for paying this fee, but I do feel that it needs to have a time to have a limit. What is the acceptable offer and what kind of time limit would we be looking at for entering in such an agreement? If the contracts provide prove to be fruitful, I don't mind paying the fee, but I feel it shouldn't be paid indefinitely. We are not buying any equipment or any physical location, basically just purchasing the name, logos, graphics, and contracts. Okay, so Brad, there's a couple of ways to look at this. Um, I would be, uh, let's see here. You could calculate the amount of money that you think this is worth, okay? So you could look at it and you can analyze it and you can say, okay, um, the potential money we can make is X. Uh, with this business so given what they're bringing to the table and the resources and knowledge and maybe some process hopefully some processes and other things that allow you to, to continue the existing contracts and relationships and potentially get new ones you could look at it and you can say what if we limit this to a certain number and just I'm gonna make up a number let's say fifty thousand dollars when you get the fifty thousand dollars worth of investment or of, of paid out then you've reached that number and that you have that agreement with them, okay? Um, but in reading the question here for a second time, so I read it earlier and I thought about it a little bit, and I'm and like, okay, so maybe you have a, an initial amount. But also I'm thinking that what is the concern if you have profitability, if they, if you, if they bring you a new contract or a new relationship and you pay them 10, 15, 20% of that, do you still have a lot of profitability? You can always consider that those existing relationships are going to be much better and easier to get on board and and get moving forward based on history and so forth these people may have. So anytime they bring you a relationship, if you, they get a percentage of that, 
I don't think that's a big deal. I mean, if you had somebody you were paid on board to market, you would be paying them to market. Or if they you weren't paying them a lot, but paying them commission, they would be getting a commission off of everything you sold. You could consider these people to be like salespeople for you, and that anytime they help bring you something, no matter what the time frame is, it, you're going to get a percentage. Why stop? the gravy train if you limit this to a year or two years and then after that you don't pay them anything well do they have any incentive to bring you any business i'd always give them incentive to bring me business and do so at at a number that percentage wise i know i'm going to make money maybe it's at percent higher percentage on these new people okay is one way to look at it maybe they get 40 percent or 30 percent off of the relationships because they're transferring over and that can be looked at kind of like as you're selling them this is where you're buying their value and their history uh, from them but as some time goes on maybe after you feel like you've paid out an amount that's equal to some number that you come up with and calculate for would be a fair value for what you're getting then the percentage drops down to 10 15 20 percent Okay. But I don't think I would ever end it. I would just maybe minimize the amount that would be appropriate as a commission for somebody that brings you this. Now think about that. If you hired somebody, if you were going out and they were selling this, how much would you pay them to bring you that business? How much is it worth to you? So anyway, those are some thoughts on that, Brad. Hopefully that'll help out and um, uh, so forth. Just checking to make sure I didn't have any other thoughts there. Next question, Melinda asked, should I rent a brick and mortar office space? Business description, background and question, I'm a nurse practitioner with a health and wellness practice. Startup, or small, parentheses, small startup side gig, still not very established, unquote, or on parentheses there. I'm primarily offering concierge home services right now. I keep tossing around the idea of having a brick and mortar locations thinking that it might be somewhat easier to market. Of course, that comes with more overhead exp um, expenses. I definitely have some fear around this and you know, biting off more than I can chew. To mitigate some of this, I am also, consider also considering, if allowed in the lease, subletting part of the space to other professionals who offer service that complement but don't compete with mine. I plan to reach out to the landlord for the space I'm interested in this Friday to get more information. Okay. Hi, Melinda. Uh, let's see here. I, you know, this question is is uh, one that you have to factor in quite a few things. You haven't given me that information here. So, so let me ask you some questions. What are your current revenues and and expenses and what's left over do you have enough money right now with the business that you're doing currently to pay for this rent okay if you don't and you're assuming that just having that business is going to drive business to you then that's a potential for concern and risk um, you currently are going to people so your business is based on a certain approach a certain model and you want to change that model. Is that going to change the level of business? Are you still going to go out and uh, see people and travel to them, but also bring people to you based on your location? Okay. Yes, sometimes having a location makes you seem more uh, established, more credible, builds maybe a, a higher level of initial trust. And that can be good, but then again, it's not good if it's gonna soak up all your money, okay? If you're gonna be working 60, 70, 80 hours, or 45, whatever it may be, if you're working all that time and you're not making any money, then what is the use? So, and then plus, and also, renting space that's bigger so that you can put other people in it, is if you already don't have these relationships in play, then you're looking at paying out expense for the potential of getting people to sublease for the potential that they can bring you other business which i like that you know environment where you have a place and other people around you i see this in um a place i go to get i go to this guy in knoxville tennessee to do, get some stretching he's in this building that's 
leased out to individuals, just one little rooms where you got the massage people in there, you got the stretching people in there, you got the acupuncture people in there, you've got the um, uh, different like uh, psych psychological type services, consulting services, things like that, that you can get that they can cross reference and benefit each other. But doing this where you have a bigger space that you sublease to people, you are taking responsibility to be a landlord and a lot more risk that's associated with that. So I would think about that a little bit and really factor in what are your, what's your business model first, okay? If your business model is traveling and you're getting clients by doing that, they do they like it that way or did you feel by talking to them that they would be more comfortable coming to a location? So, and if you're, if you adjust the business model so you have a location that they can come to, but you can also travel to people, what does that look like? It's best for us to always in business to focus on one thing and do it very, very, very well. So if your business is out traveling to people and you do that very well and you've got, you create a lot of efficiencies around it, then I would continue to stay within a world that's creating a lot of efficiency. Are you making so much money that it's going, you're going to be able to make even more money if you have the business, if you have the location. And also if you have the location, will, um, are, are, are you making enough money already to pay for that new location? Okay. Not always that you have to have the money right now to pay it, but you just have a, a lot of confidence and a lot of marketplace indicators that say that you'll get more business if you have that location. Okay, so I just, it's tough. You I mean, you get into a place, some places are now are wanting people um, bec uh, to fill up spots because so many people are working out of the home and so many people, the world that we're living in is people can operate their business from the home, which is my business and my software company. I work from wherever I am and then I have my team in India that gets the work done. So I can be anywhere. I don't pay for office space anymore. I paid a lot of money in office space over the years. I'm very glad that money's going into my pocket now and not going out to a landlord, okay? So a few more things that really could be digested here on, and I can, I'd be happy to brainstorm this to you if you want to email me at greg at efficience.us. That's E-F-F-I-C-I-E-N-C-E dot U-S. Okay, I hope that helps. There's a lot to that, and it can be a, a big investment and a big step. So, um, okay, Melinda, you're asking, yeah, you're asking another question. So, Melinda asks, Melinda Clark asks, should I form a parent holding company, specifically looking to do this in Wyoming? Business description and background of question. This is uh, completely separate from my healthcare business. I purchased my first investment rental property in Florida. Um, I, I live in New York, New York. I am looking to transfer the property to an LLC. My goal is to acquire more properties eventually and have a separate LLC for each state I invest in. I recently consulted with an attorney in Wyoming after hearing that LLC formed uh, there have more privacy. They do not publicly list personal information. I'm considering a Wyoming parent holding LLC and then operating those additional LLC subs subsidiaries for each state through that parent company. It's my understanding that this will be more protection of my assets, and I plan to have a lot more assets down the road. Well, congrats on that, Melinda. Okay, so what are your thoughts here? Well, first of all, this is better, a question is better asked for some type of attorney, okay, that can talk to. I've set up LLCs. I've looked at different states for LLCs. Um, I have one in Florida. I have one in Florida. I have one in Nevada. Um, I had one in Delaware. So I have had different LLCs around. As far as what you're talking about owning, owning these for real estate, it's good to have each property, investment property you have, it's good to have its own LLC associated with it, okay? I've learned that from different um, people that do that do a lot of this and also talking to different attorneys and accountants about it. So one thing that I want some comments that I'll make is that fact, the main comment being that you need to talk to an attorney about this, but um, just some side notes relative to what you're doing here. You are talking about owning properties in different areas. Okay. 
I have been seeing people that when they get too many things outside of where they are and where they can handle, it's a big distraction and a lot of time waste, okay? You are in New York, you have a property in Florida. Why is that? Why do you not own properties in New York where you are? Okay, probably a lot of good reasons why you do. I'm just asking that question so that if you're gonna go buy property in Wyoming or property in other places, how are these properties being managed? Are you set up with some management relationship that they're gonna, somebody's gonna get 10, 15, 20% of your rental income to take care of everything for you? Because if you're setting up properties in Florida, in Wyoming, in California, and Tennessee, you and you don't have that in place, it's gonna drive you crazy and dealing with all the little nuances about bringing people in, getting them re-rented, getting it cleaned up, getting it, um, getting the contracts, all just all, all that stuff. Getting the fixes done, this broke down, my toilet's not working, something's going on. So anyway, factoring that in. If you've got that covered, then yes, setting these up, being in an LLC. Should you have an umbrella LLC? I, I'm not gonna answer that question because there's reasons for it and maybe complete waste of time for you and expense to be doing that based on other parameters. How many assets do you own right now? Is it, is it really necessary that because of Wyoming that they're not going to disclose information? How important is that going to be to you? What's the, what's the potential for you being sued in your current business or by one of these properties? So there's a lot of things to evaluate there to see if you really need, even need to go through the expenses of some of this thinking. But maybe you do. So but I'm not here to tell you one way or the other. So anyway, um, I hope that gives you a little bit of insight, Melinda. And again, I'm here to, to be emailed to talk to you about this a little bit more. So anyway, that is all my questions for this month. I hope you guys got a little bit of, of insight and, and experience share from that. That could be helpful. Until uh, till next time, uh, you guys have a good month. And keep moving onward and upward. Have a good one. See you. A.O. Bye now.